Today's guest went from dodging IRS calls to helping thousands of people get out of debt and build a life and business they love. Welcome to the Inspired Money Podcast, where we explore positive money stories. I'm Andy, host and financial advisor at Runnymede Capital Management. If you want to shift your perspectives on money and use your money for good to make a bigger impact, welcome to the Inspired Money channel, where you'll get interviews and money tips. On Inspired Money episode 186, we're talking with Karen McCall, founder of the Financial Recovery Institute and creator of the money management program, Money Grid. Many regard her as the original money coach. We're going to discuss our relationship with money, what a bad one looks like, how an improved relationship with money can really open up great opportunities. In this episode, you'll learn how Karen went from feeling scared to death about money to mastering her relationship with money. What role emotion plays in money management? And listen to the end to hear what Karen wants her legacy to be. Now let's get inspired with Karen McCall. Welcome, Karen. I'm so excited to have you on Inspired Money. Thank you, Andy. So nice to be here. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? Oh my gosh. Well, my very first childhood memory of, with money was riding in a truck with my grandfather who was, um, he had a big truck full of hay. And my grandparents were very poor and he delivered some hay and got a big check. I was probably, you know, eight or nine years old. And um, he showed me the check. It was a big thing for him. And then the check disappeared. So that was a really scary thing. You know, I just remember that was my very first memory of money. And um, and then the other thing was, you know, my father at one point um, gave me money to go and buy an ice cream cone. And then he came out and caught me and said, oh, no, no, don't do that. You know, so just a lot of fear around money for me in the early days. What does that mean that your grandfather's check disappeared? We just couldn't find it. You know, I had it in the truck and then it was just, we couldn't find it. It, I don't know whether it blew out or whatever. I mean, he of course got it replaced, but as a child that young and knowing how poor my grandparents were, it was just something that really stuck with me. Um, and particularly when I started my own journey and writing my own money autobiography, that memory came flooding back at that time. I can see why that would strike fear in you at an early age. But I didn't know if that meant that your grandfather spent it really quickly, but it literally disappeared. No, the check was, the check disappeared. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I'm told that you are the OG of money coaching for entrepreneurs and individuals. You're highly regarded as an expert coach and speaker, but you didn't always have this masterful relationship with money. Can you take us back to your past, what does a horrible relationship with money look like? Yes, the way I describe it is I was in a money coma, completely unconscious. And the way it looked was I was divorced and had gotten a substantial amount of money, more than I had ever seen before. And um, my uncle asked me if I was investing it in mutual funds and I said yes. I had no idea what mutual funds were and I was too embarrassed to ask him. And so I just spent the money. I just didn't work. I just kind of lived the life of, you know, somebody where this was going to last forever and it didn't. And what eventually happened is I ran up um, credit card debt. I also had not paid the IRS for the um, inherit, not the inheritance, but the settlement. And so I decided I had to go to work. So I found a fabulous career in San Francisco, working for the second largest computer company in the world, had a beautiful office and a big round building corner office. And if you would have seen me, you would have thought, wow, this woman is really a success. But what you wouldn't have known is that behind that successful looking facade, I was on the verge of eviction. I had a big bowl on top of my refrigerator with all of my bills in it, including the ones from the IRS. And the day that I came home and they said, hmm, this is serious, you have to pay your rent. Um, I pulled down that bowl and that was the start of, you know, I really need to face what I'm doing and do something different and, uh, you know, face the music. And it, it was pretty darn scary at that time because I had no clue what to do. What, what happened that drove you to that, like, coming to Jesus moment when you took that jar off the refrigerator? Yeah. 
Well, I think what it was, was that eviction notice. You know, it was like, oh my gosh, I have to do something. And I was dating a guy at the time, and this was a long time ago, Andy, probably way back, when they had binders of cassette players, you know, all these self-help things like, um, and so that night when I pulled this bowl down, I went to that stack of cassettes that this guy had been bringing me. He knew something was wrong. I never offered to pay for anything, right? Never a chip or anything. And so he knew that there was something wrong. And so I pulled out this um, binder of cassette players and it was Possibility Thinking by Dr. Robert Schuler. And just putting those tapes on and listening to him, you know, I just kept the courage going where I opened everything, threw away the duplicates and thought, okay, what am I going to do? And at that time, you know, we didn't have Google, we had the yellow pages. And so what I did is I looked in the yellow pages and um, all I saw were people like you, the financial people, right? And budget counselors, that was it. So obviously I wasn't gonna be a candidate for you. And so I'll try budget counseling. So I, I did that and it lasted for about two seconds because what they do is they say, give us your money we'll pay your bills and we'll give you an allowance. Um, but <clears throat> again, it didn't address anything that was going on in terms of, you know, why was I spending every dime that I had? Why was I living beyond my means? And so um, I decided that I really needed something different and I couldn't find anything. So I, I just said, okay, I'm gonna get smart with money. And I decided to do two things. One is I went to therapy. And the other thing is I found a 12-step program that started, that talked a bit about money stuff. And so it, both of those things were helpful, incredibly helpful, but I knew that there needed to be more. You know, in the 12-step meetings, they talked about, we'll do a spending plan, you know, and, um, and don't use credit cards. And that was helpful, but again, I just kept thinking, there's more, there's more, you need to do more. I just kept thinking that I was really a tough case. And um, so I just, I, and I, you know, I just feel like I was kind of guided, if you will, because it seems like I, I then thought, okay, I really don't like working in corporate America. I decided to take a career exploration class. And in that class, they ask us to look at our values, our skills, and our interests. And I thought, what turns me on more than anything right now is the stuff I'm doing around money. And I bet there are other people like me who are caught in this gap between the financial people and the budget counselors. And so within two and a half years of when I started my journey, I opened the doors to financial recovery. Karen, how common is it, you mentioned that you had this facade. On the exterior, you appeared to be a very successful career professional, but what was happening behind the financial scenes didn't match. How common is that? with the clients that you've worked with over the years? You know, actually very, very common. And this was one of the things that was a surprise to me, Andy. I thought that people who would come to see me would be people like myself, you know, debt, and like debt is the issue, credit cards is the issue. Um, and, oh my gosh, and I was fortunate, I got a lot of publicity early on. I was in the San Francisco Bay Area, and. Um, just from the networking I was doing, there were a lot of magazine articles and newspaper interviews. And so I, I had a lot of exposure and oh my gosh, I remember this one Saturday morning, this article came out in the Marin IJ in Marin County, California. And by Monday morning, my voicemail was full and I had a movie star. I had doctors, dentists, lawyers, and it was just, you know, it was just the floodgates where people were hungry to understand more about just like the dollars and cents of money. They knew that, you know, there was something emotionally going on for them too, you know, low self-esteem, pride, um, insecurities, and you know, hey, I'll just pretend like everything's okay. But, you know, eventually that, it just doesn't work over the long run. You know, people end up either going in debt or they start having, physical issues, you know, the worry about it all, the facade, it, it takes a lot of energy to keep that up. So you definitely tapped into something because just one article drove all these 
inquiries, people reaching out to you for help. So you you found a good niche where you could help people. Mm -hmm. That two and a half years before you opened or before you hung out your shingle and started your business, what did that look like? Because you mentioned that you didn't know what mutual funds were. So part of that relationship with money was that you needed to educate yourself, but then there's also the emotional side. So what did that process look like for you? How did you teach yourself? Yeah, that's such a fabulous question. And I was thinking about um, our interview today and kind of going back and, and reliving that early experience. What was that like? And, you know, sometimes people will say, well, what's your education? And I'll say, you know, it's not, there was nothing in my education that trained me to do this. I really developed my own, own curriculum at this point. And so my curriculum did look like in the beginning therapy for myself to understand some of the childhood trauma. And I, I was a really sick kid in the hospital a lot. A lot of stuff that had happened to me as a child that had impacted me. Um, but I also knew that I wanted to get smart financially. So I did hook up with a guy like you and, um, you know, I took his classes and we became friends and he referred me clients and I referred him clients. And then I also hooked up with some of the people at Nola Press. Nola Press is a publishing company that publishes legal books for civilians. Um, and you know, they had, um, there were so few books on the market at that time. Very few. Now you can go to a bookstore. And, you know, there's shelves and shelves of books on money and psychology. And, um, but at that time, there were very few. So I hooked up with the, the lawyers at Nolo Press who wrote books on bankruptcy and um, renter's rights and just all of the legal books with money. And so I just created this curriculum for myself. But the other thing I think that made my work, made the process successful was because I had great empathy and compassion for what people were going through. People feel so much shame and embarrassment when, I mean, I remember the financial planner who leaned over and he said, if my clients knew my situation, they wouldn't want to work with me. That shame, you know, and, and he was a good, honest guy, but for some reason, you know, he was out of control with money and he didn't recognize, um, I mean, he didn't recognize until he found me that, oh, I need to deal with this both from a financial point of view, but also a, an emotional, spiritual. That's point super of view. interesting because in in the financial planner's case, he had knowledge. It wasn't a it wasn't not knowing what a mutual fund is. So, right. I guess specifically within that example, what did you need to explore? You know, um, the way I like to talk about it is uh, the process would help people. First of all, get very conscious and connected to their money and to start looking at the behaviors and what they planned on doing and what they actually did do. And then to take that piece and to say, my intention was to spend in this way, but what I did was this. And then to trace it back to say, okay, what emotions were going on for you at that time? When you, when you went to Nordstrom's and you thought you were you know, gonna spend $100 maybe getting a two, couple tubes of lipstick, um, and you walked out charging $1,000 because you saw this beautiful, you know, leather jacket that you wanted. And so people to kind of trace back at what was going on for you at that moment. You know, were they angry? Did they fight with somebody? Um, were they feeling depressed or lonely? But a lot of them to start connecting on what the emotional drivers were. So the very first book I wrote was... Um, it was a personal writing your personal autobiography so i would have people write from their very earliest memories of money um, through their adolescent years young adulthood into present day and sometimes just the insight of going oh yeah this happened in my family this really impacted me and now this is a reaction to that so to start bringing those subconscious um, you know buried memories um, up to realize this is, you know, this is the trigger. This is what I do. And now having to learn to deal with that trigger and have a different kind of behavior. Um, and so when I, when I talk about, you know, the early childhood memories, for a lot of people, um, you know, our deepest needs are really to be, you know, connected with other people, right? You know, we want to feel we make a difference in the world, that we matter. And so I really tuned into what 
is the person's deepest need. So another exercise I would have people do is as we would look at every category of their spending, I would want them to evaluate how that you know, that part of their life was working. So we would get to their home and I'd say, okay, Mary, how do you feel about your home? And she might say, you know, um, I never have anybody over. I'm embarrassed. The cat shredded my couch. We've got all this deferred maintenance. So, you know, just to start looking at all of the incompletions in their life and all of the areas of deprivation that they're living with and how to start spending their resources, their time, energy, and money to start taking care of and meeting their needs. And in starting to do that on kind of a physical level, um, it starts pushing a person more inward where they start feeling more deserving. And so believe it or not, what the, this, the drive to spend and get rid of the money may seem like, um, oh, you know, they're just gonna feel better as they get more and more things, but they feel worse because it's a poor substitute for what they really deeply need. Do you still have clients work on like a money autobiography? I know that I, I saw that you have a concept where you have people kind of write that autobiography to try to bring out what was the early relationship with money growing up, their family, and some of those stories. You know, not every client, and I no longer work with clients. I um, I moved, for, one of the things that happened too was some of the people that started working with me just loved the work, they loved what it did for them, and they saw that I had a nice lifestyle. And so um, they wanted me to train them to be money coaches. So about 10 years after I was in private practice just for myself, I started training money coaches. So many of them, depending on the client and where they are, but another exercise that we will have business people do is to do a work history autobiography. Because you know, the statistics about um, people starting their own business, right? Within the first five years, many, many, many fail. And so I realized early on that I needed to bring everything that I was doing with a person in their personal life into their business, all of the same parts of the process. Because you probably know this, a lot of people will say, well, you know, try to get them working on their personal finances, but then they have their own business and then it's like, okay, well, that I can do out of my business. That's a business expense, right? A lot of rationalizing and justifying. So I realized early on that people who had their, their small businesses, they had a back door and we needed to close that door and include the same process with their business finances. And that's one of the reasons that I went into the software business. I never thought I would be in software business. Um, my system in the beginning was a paper and pencil system. Here's for your personal spending plan. Here's for your business. But technology, right, demanded that People then wanted it on Excel, and then in 2013, we launched our first um, software. And then in, this year, we just launched you know, MoneyGrit, the newest. And because there was nothing on the market that did much more than a lot of rear view mirror accounting. You know, look after the fact. And so I want people to do their plan, track against their plan. That's how they get to see the emotions and the triggers that may be um, driving their behavior. When they deviate from their plan, then that's an opportunity to say, did you deviate because you didn't plan enough, because you've never planned? Did you deviate because something came up you could not have anticipated? Or I thought I wanted it to heck with my spending plan. So just starting to get people to connect consequences with their behaviors um, for personal people and also for people in business. Karen, when it comes to investing, I find that emotion is often a bad thing. Like when I make an investment decision, it's best when it's free of emotion because I can be more objective and I, I believe that I can make smarter decisions. Where does the emotion fit into the healthy money relationship? It sounds like one is identifying one's emotions so that you understand it, but can you explain? Well, you know, let's, let's think about it this way. A healthy thinker, um, they think about something they want to spend money on or invest or whatever, you know, and then they have a process where they um, 
connect up the consequences, and then they make a strong decision. And this could be something that happens in a few seconds for a small thing, or if somebody's buying property or you know, house or car, it might be something that they are involved in for um, a longer period of time. But healthy thinkers, they, they do that. They connect it all up, and then they make the appropriate decision. Unhealthy thinkers split off their consequences from their decision making, and that's why credit cards become a problem for a lot of people because the pain, we have two primary emotions, right? Pain and pleasure. Pleasure of buying something, if I can remove the pain by putting on a credit card, pay for it later. So, um, you know, that's why connecting the, starting to have people come out of denial on every level and start recognizing that there are emotions and behaviors and we want to get to get to the point where they're working together and not um, denied. Hmm. And this, this idea of that, well, because you've been working with clients for so long and in money for so long, how do you define money? <laughs> I think it's a, of it as a tool, definitely, right? I mean, we want to, it's definitely a tool. Um, it's a tool that a person can hopefully create the type of lifestyle that's going to be meaningful to them. Uh, and, you know, that's another thing. It's like, what is meaningful for each person? If they're living in survival and they're constantly in denial and they're suffering, they never get to that place of, well, what would I really like my lifestyle to be like? Do I want to? Do I want to, you know, be able to make a difference in other people's lives? Um, and, you know, having money, you can do that as well. So I think of it as a tool. Um, how would you think about it as a financial planner? I think of it as a tool also mm -hmm. um, because it can give us freedom. It can, we can use it to purchase something. We can use it to purchase things that we need and to survive. Um, and I think that it's also a tool because it enables or empowers us to help people yeah. uh, if we want to do that. Absolutely. And we, we have choices, right? Absolutely have choices. And, and so, so occasionally I would have clients who were referred to me because they had sudden wealth or inherited wealth. And, you know, that created its own, you know, my fantasy would have been before I started my business that, hey, if I had you know a million dollars, I'd be fine. But what I grew to learn from the different types of clients is that a lot of times people who have inherited a lot of money, I had several clients like that and, and sudden money and realizing that, no, that wasn't the answer. You know, they could do the same things, just a lot more zeros and they were still miserable. So regardless of where someone was, um, we wanted to look at where they were, where they started from, and where they were headed. And if they didn't like where they were headed, then we really needed a new map for how they were going to have a different ending to the story. And a lot of that was based in having people begin to get in touch with what they truly needed, you know, what really satisfied them, what really where did they feel gratification in their life rather than this constant longing and craving for more shiny objects? Because the shiny objects don't do it. You know, you can never get enough of what you don't need. Yeah, I think that that, that, um, that the feeling that people are trying to, or that void that people are trying to fill by purchasing something, it does feel good momentarily, but then it's fleeting and it doesn't solve the void in the first place. You're, you're, you just put the nail on the head. It's that void. It's that void that people are trying, trying to fill. You know, they want to feel different than they do. How do people figure out or identify what is that void? How do they, how do they actually fix the problem so that it's not purchasing things? You know, I just love that you asked that question, and I hope I can do justice. You know, it's this process. Sometimes the process is a little bit difficult to explain. But the way I would do it is I created, you know, we, I would have every client do a spending plan. You know, but as we were doing their spending plan, people think of it as a budget. I use the word 
spending and earning plan just so that people who get triggered from the idea of budgets or diets, you know, just the to B change that for bit. Mm -hmm. And so as we would go through these categories and assess the quality of their life in each category where money touches, um, and they start identifying, I'll give you, these, these are simple, um, ex these are simple examples. Okay, so windshield wipers, you get to transportation. I can't tell you how often people would say, well, it's raining and it's snowing or my windshield wipers or, you know, I haven't winterized my car. Okay, then we put that on their needs list. This is something they have to do. This isn't a want, this is a need. And so every time that for any category in their life where they're spending money, if we could identify those areas where they're neglecting their needs and they start taking care of those, it starts pushing them deeper. And then they start going, because I think, uh, Andy, a lot of people who do that, they don't believe that they deserve to have, to have money, love, security, they just, their self-esteem, their worthiness is just, you know, it's been damaged in some way. And so starting to take care of the windshield wipers, these little things, all of a sudden it's like, oh, they stand a little taller, they feel a little better. And that is, and it's a process that takes time, it doesn't happen overnight, but there will be big aha moments with a little thing like that. Hmm. And what role does having a bigger sense of purpose play? Oh, well, I know for me, it's been the thing that really has transformed my life. Um, when I was isolated and worried about money, it was my big secret about how bad things were. I was very, you know, my kids were in college. I was alone for the first time in my life. Um, and I was, I mean, nobody would have known it, but I was really, other than going to work, I was leading a pretty isolated life. And so the thing that has been so wonderful for me in this work was making it, earning a good living, absolutely a good thing. But I, that feeling that I made a difference, this process that I created made a difference in people's lives. And so that feeling first came from working with clients and then uh, developing a training program so I could train money coaches internationally. That was like, you know, my kids having kids, you know, I'm, I am a grandmother and I love being a grandmother, but it was the same. It was like these coaches are now going out and they are having a ripple effect. They're helping people. And I think um, most of us want to feel that we have, we're making some kind of a difference in the world, you know, whether it's just with our family and loved ones or with it, you know, in our profession, touching more people. I'm wondering in the course of working with both individuals and then teaching coaches, you, you have had a positive impact on people and their finances and then empowering coaches to go do their work in the world. How has like having a great relationship with money? I know in your life that's opened unimaginable opportunities. So I, I'm curious, like, for you personally, from horrible to great uh, relationship with money, how did that open the doors? And what have you seen with other people? Um, just these opportunities that open. Well, it's been um, really wonderful to develop my training program and to train many coaches around the world because to see them, and, and interestingly, it's um, a lot of, people who are maybe closer to retirement age, I'd have a lot of people in their 50s and 60s want to do this because they can leave their corporate job and they can just subsidize their retirement and, and still be making a difference in people's lives. And oh my gosh, all of the coaches who, even ones who have offices, because a lot of the coaches will have uh, an office where they see people, but they'll also do phone appointments for people internationally, for example. Um, with COVID, hardly any of them skipped a beat because they had the ability to still work with people, um, you know, through Zoom and the different technologies that we have. But I know for me, I would have never believed, I, I've all, my second husband um, was a history professor and we spent a couple of summers in Europe and I just fell in love with Europe and had a desire to travel. 
And I never dreamt that it would be possible that my husband could retire early and, and we could take off and plan on, you know, traveling around Europe for two or three years. And it was just, I mean, just opened the door for me. And the other thing is being able to continue to grow my business and develop products as I see needs for it. Um, we're working with a company in Barcelona, developing, which has developed our newest software program. Um, it's just been amazing. And sometimes it's hard to even take it in. And I'm going to just say it out loud because I'll be 78 this year and I want to own my legacy, right? And I thought, I created a profession. I created a profession. That is huge. Yeah. And by the way, there were, uh, I remember one year speaking for the, um, oh, I get National Association of Financial Planners, something like that in California. And um, some of the, some of the um, financial planners hired some money coaches to work in their office. And, and so there was a lot of trading back and forth because what financial planners found sometimes was they do these wonderful plans for people. They send them away and, you know, nothing happens because they're not able to implement the plan because of their behaviors with money. So all that lost opportunity. I love that partnership. That's not something that we've done at our company, but I love the concept. It makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Karen, we're coming out of this very, very unusual year. What tips do you have for people and their businesses to get on track going forward? Oh, wow. You know, my heart just aches almost every day. I have a combination of uh, pain, just knowing how many people have been devastated with COVID. You know, all the people who've lost their jobs, have lost their careers, families that don't know how they're going to put food on the table or pay their rent. I mean, it's just, it's really, really been a tough year. Um, and I, I think that for everyone, you know, it's get really grounded in your numbers. I think about the people who have been in, just living in so much deprivation this last year, you know, waiting for their little stimulus checks. Um, and going to food banks and all. So you can imagine if they get jobs and they start earning again, there can be such a deep well of unmet needs. It could be e very easy to um, spend money unconsciously, not necessarily taking care of the most important things. So that would be my hope for people would be that they get support if they need it and they really get grounded in, okay, you know, what are my options? Um, I could see people feeling a lot of pressure to pay some of their bills and maybe not have money for food. I mean, it's going to be tough decisions for people to make as they get these stimulus checks. So it sounds like planning will be as important as ever. Food, health care, transportation. I mean, they really need to take care of the basics. But knowing people as I do, I know that with that kind of deprivation, there is that tendency to want a quick hit, you know, or just, or not knowing what to do, just not knowing what to do. Well, people will also need to buy some clothes because they're going to need something other than yoga pants and sweatpants. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? So I don't know if that's a need, <laughs> want, or <laughs> well, extra. I know, I'm glad you said that because this is the thing too. A lot of times it's difficult for people because in the software, one of the things I've built in is an actual needs and wants list. So that, you know, we have a place to go in and as, as people are looking at the different categories of their spending plan, it's like, oh yeah, I do need some clothes. You know, it goes on their needs list or it goes on their wants list. And this is really tough for people sometimes to differentiate between, well, what's a want and what's a need, right? And so what I tell people, if you're stuck and you don't know which list it goes on, put it on both because the time will become clear. But the thing is, is for people to not feel guilty if their need is different than their neighbors. You know, like what you need, Andy, may be different than, you know, your best friend or your partner. Um, and I know my husband and I have different needs. And to just say, these are my needs and they count and not to feel embarrassed and try to hide them because the more we shut off from our needs, the more susceptible we're going to be to do more impulse spending. You said that you never really foresaw being a 
or being in the software business mm. and money grit is a software uh, offering how is it that you found a partner in barcelona to do the development well, the last time when we, in 2013, when we launched our first software program, we took investors and, um, you know, and from 2013 to now, it was, you know, the technology has really, really changed. And so when we realized we really need to redo the software, um, just less expensive to do it in Europe than it is here. That was the number one reason that we went there. And we're so happy with, with the team that we found. Um, and it was fun to go and meet them in person as well. Right. It's a good excuse to have to go to, Absolutely. to go to Spain for a little while. Exactly. Was that part of your travels last year or for the motivation to go there? What a great question. No one's asked me that. Um, well, the first goal was to decide whether I was just going to let money mind or die a natural death or whether I was going to do a new software program because money and, minder was sort of version 2.0 and then money grid is version 3.0 yeah, exactly well yeah and the note like the book and binder that. the pen and paper maybe 1.0 yeah the pencil and paper system that i first had and then so that was 1.0 and then excel was 2.0 and then money minder was 3.0 and now we're at 4.0 um and, you know, I mean, when you get to a certain age, you do, you think, okay, am I going to kind of not work anymore? Or because I knew that would be a big, um, a big task. Because it's very, because I built all of this emotional stuff into it. It's not just like a spreadsheet. And, um, and so when we first arrived in Europe, we did a lot of walking in nature. That's where I go to kind of contemplate and get guidance about what my next steps are and so my decision was am I going what am I going to do and um, I decided no I as part of my legacy I, I really want to bring this up to you know technology standards for today you mentioned your age what like how how long do you want to continue working and what is it that you wish your legacy to be? I think that you've, you've sort of, uh, you, you've implied what that is, but what do you want to, what do you want to leave behind? Yes, I want to make my work available to as many people as possible at different price points. For all of these years, I focus primarily these last few years training many coaches, and that's it. And so now I'm creating some low cost courses. And um, uh, for three years, I just did a free every month, you know, 90 minute webinar for people. I just want to bring my work to a broader audience. Um, and the difference between my husband and me, my husband was dying to retire. He really didn't like being an attorney. And so he's younger than I am. He's seven years younger, and he's been retired now for almost two years. And um, I really when you ask me that question and other people ask me that question, I don't see, I, I want to have the choice of working or not, but I really, I don't see, oh, in three or four years from now, I'll be retired. My work will be different. It will be, and, and it is even now, you know, I'm not training anymore. I'm not, I'm doing a lot of the things I was doing right now. I'm, um, you know, loving our new baby and getting it launched, Money Grit. But I just, you know, I don't, in my life, I don't see quitting or retiring. I just think things change and evolve. I love working. Um, I think it will always be a part of my life, but I don't work the way I used to work. You know, I don't work every single day. I don't work every single week. We have a lot of flexibility in our schedule. This goal to bring this tool to many, many people and at a low cost, does that require a massive investment on your part? Fairly good investment, yes, and a lot of marketing. Um, you know, having opportunities like this, and you know, being on your podcast and letting people know what is available. Um, but it is. And, and one of the reasons it made it possible for us to do was, you know, taking it to Barcelona to have developed rather than being able to develop it here. Well, not only is it a good place to go visit your partner, but you can get some good food there too. Oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> you are so right. We had a favorite restaurant we went to 
almost every night because I just couldn't imagine anything being better. What's yes. it called? Do you know the name? I don't off the top of my head, but I'll let you know, okay? <laughs> yes, I, I still dream of the paella in, oh. in Barcelona. So you've been to Barcelona. You know how special it is. It's been a long time, but yes, mm. I, I would love to get back. And I have friends who worked there for a while, but uh, some American friends who worked there and they enjoyed it in their younger days, like they were in their 20s and they said they loved the lifestyle, but they had to come back to the United States because it was too much partying for them. Oh, okay. <laughs> they said it was going to be detrimental to, to their, their long term health. health. Right. Yes. Karen, I like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? I, I would say that it's having choices. It's, um, you know, going to be able to go to sleep at night and feel good about what you're doing. Um, definitely getting to the point where you are able to meet more than just your needs, but some of your wants and desires. Um, as well. And, um, and I know for me, it has been being able to, to heal myself and to be able to, you know, bring some of this healing to other people through my through my teachings and my process. Yeah, I mean, I, when I think about my success, I think I earn good money, I like that. And what really feeds my soul, though, is just knowing that um, I've made a difference in people's lives. I love that. And that the coaches I've trained are making a difference in people's lives. Yeah, they continue to do great work. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing your personal story as well as your professional story and how you've grown and continue to grow your business. Can you tell the Inspired Money listener where they can find more about Money Grit and follow you and learn more? There's two, um, I have two links for you. One is um, financialrecovery.com. And that tells about, uh, and I have a really nice free ebook uh, for people to look at their relationship to work and earning money. And uh, so financialrecovery.com and then moneygrit.com. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Karen. Thank you, Andy. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So what was your favorite inspired money moment? I liked it when Karen said, you need to look at where you were, where you are, and where you're headed. If you don't like where you're headed, make a new map to get to where you want. A little bit of planning and execution can go a very long way. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, please let me know by posting a comment below. And for watching until the end, I want to send you an Inspired Money sticker or button. Go to inspiredmoney.fm slash Andy. Send me your name and address, and I will send you real mail. Thank you for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.